Welcome back to part two of The Guilty Feminist. So plug in and get ready for the fun. Hello, Melbourne. Are you ready for a little bit more Guilty Feminist? Then welcome back to the stage, Deborah Francis White and Celia Bacola. Hey, Mahal. What a wonderful audience you're being. You all right there, Celia? Yep. Give me a second. I forgot my foot fit ball. I was genuinely going to bring... Oh, yes, that would have been ball. wonderful. Is that like, like one of those balance balls you sit on? Yeah. To make Turn sure. everyone on. <laughs> but I forgot it. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. I also make some new sounds now. That's fun. Oh, I'm so excited to meet this bambino. <laughs> You're doing so well. We Thank were just you. reminiscing out the back that the last time Celia and I worked <laughs> together, she just started doing Dancing with the Stars. Yes. Yeah. And she was saying, oh, it's like he's teaching a fridge to walk. And then I won it. I know. First comedian to yep, ever win first it. first comedian to win it. Yeah. And- Thank you. And we talked about it and won $50,000 for Safe Steps, which I talked about oh, in Guilty yes. Feminist. That's my charity. Absolutely extraordinary. It's very good. Um, and, yeah, your first comedian to win it. Not that comedians are bad at dancing. It's just normally yes. like an ice skater or something at dance, because they've already brought other skills to it. Yeah, comedians are absolutely bad at dancing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they are. But somehow, you were just... Because we obviously I couldn't watch the show in uh, Britain, but I could watch all the clips every week, so I would wait till the clips so came exciting. out. And you were in It really was so incredible. bizarre. No one watched it. Like, it was right dovetailed right into the start of the pandemic. Do you remember that? Like, it was the beginning yeah. of 2020. And there was one episode, because it's live, so we went from having, like, no audience, and there was me and Jared waiting to do a jive, right? And um, Amanda and... What's his face? Bugalugs. Short guy. Fuck. Genia, thank you. Um... <laughs> I can't remember. We're about to, they're like, and now he's just, oh, hang on. And they had to cut the feed to cross live to Scott Morrison doing an emergency broadcast no. about shutting down the schools. It was like <gasps> being in an Independence Day film because it was like, oh my the God. world's going to burn. It's going to be okay. just like terror, terror, terror for five <gasps> minutes. And we're all sitting on the dance floor just waiting, not knowing how long it's going to go for. And then it went, it ended, and then they just came back and went, Celia and Jared. No. And I said to Jared, I'm like, Jared, there's a bunch of kids who watch this show who'll be fucking scared the shit out of right now. Yeah. We need to dance our fucking asses off. Yes. For the kids. For the kids. For the kids, for right? The kids. And for the I children. I have never danced better in my life. We got a perfect score. I know wow. shit. Wow. You know? It just, it just goes to... It just goes to show all you need is an impending disaster. <laughs> to it was raise just your game. It You're was... probably looking around and was the world burns going, oh, how am I going to do it? You think of Celia Picona. It was just a Giant bizarre... like you've never giant bizarre... before. It was a bizarre time I like. And then the fittest I've ever been in my whole life. And oh, then boom, two years on the couch. Blammo. Back <laughs> to normal. Well, do you miss the dancing? I kind of do. It was fun. It was hard work, but it was fun getting up every day and going, what am I doing today? Dance. Cool, that's it. Like, yeah. that was my whole day job. You know, inspired by you, I did in the pandemic, I, I think partly inspired by you, yeah, I did, because uh, I, saw, I saw you doing it, and then I thought, fuck, she could do it. No, <laughs> no, I hate it when people say that. I hate it when people go, somebody passed me a message and said, I had a comedy bit that I was doing on a tour a couple mm-hmm. of years ago, where I would end up coming out, like, in a swimsuit, and, like, I had trousers on over the top, but it was like a bit, it was a comedy bit. Mm-hmm. And somebody said... My friend said she didn't want to wear a swimsuit and then she saw you and she was really... I was like, what the fuck? I'm really hot. I was like, I'm not your, I'm not your swimsuit inspiration. I want you to look at me and go, no, I can't pull I that can't. off. I can't. I cannot follow that. I was just genuinely, I was genuinely mystified by that comment, though. I was like, in what world do you think? What, That's what? Make I me feel genuinely good. was confused by the comment. I mean, I just think it's smart. You're cold, tracks your part. Best, best of both worlds, you know? Maybe that's Am what... Am I going to bed? Am I going may, for a swim? Who knows? Yes. Well, maybe that's what she was saying, that I was, like, I had a full piece. It was a sparkly full piece swimsuit with trousers over the top. And maybe she just thought, I don't know. I don't know what she thought, but I was very insulted. I could not do that right now with the amount I'm paying. That's a disaster way to happen. Like, I wore a jumpsuit on a plane the other day, and, yeah, and I realised that's why you don't. Um... <laughs> 
But look, I, you know, I was so amazed by you dancing. I just, you know, when I came out, you, it, it was really inspired by you because we, we were, we did the show in Melbourne together and you were like, I've never done anything like this before and, you know, I'm really enjoying it. And then I, I started watching and I was like, oh my God, she's really good. So my pandemic ritual was get up because um, I thought otherwise, like, I just might You'd not be get a bit up. all day. Yeah. yeah, and then I'll work all night and I'll get depressed and I won't move at all because we, we were legally allowed only to move. Uh, yeah. We were only legally allowed out of the house once a day for a walk, um, which, you know, it, it makes you be nice to your partner because, you know, if you have a horrible route, you can only legally storm out once a day and yeah. then you're just stuck with them in terrible silence. Yeah. So um, I thought, right, to get us both out of bed... He, he would get out of bed and put the Zoom on and to my dance teacher, and I would dance for two hours every morning. And that was wow. my... Yeah, because there was a thought, I just... Not, the first hour was to make up for the fact that I wasn't doing the normal running around. The second hour was to try and get fit. <laughs> and I can do a pirouette now. Well, that's so, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Pirouette? But, that's right. That's right, my friends. I can do a pirouette. Show us! No, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. All right. Okay. And they say peer pressure is a bad thing. Peer real wet. <laughs> she, she just said that that wasn't my best one. Is the best one you go into the ground or you go into the sky? It wasn't a good landing, but, you know... That was amazing! On the the spot. I've seen you dance and win Dancing with the Stars. No, but that's incredible. But also, during lockdown, the fact that you got up every day and did two hours of dancing, do you know what I did every day? Put a bra on. That was it. (laughs) I didn't always do that. But that was the the only... That was only my you have to, just so I could differentiate between day and night. (laughs) You know? I'm like, I know what, what's happening? It's daytime. I know that feeling. Have you heard anything about birth? <laughs> like, what have you, you heard? Have you heard anything about birth? Because um, I've heard a few things and I, I don't like the sound of it. No, I did a couple of classes and I'm a, I'm a bit concerned about the exam. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the final I exam. I don't know if I could cheat off someone else in the oh, exam. Wouldn't that be great? Could you get someone to take it for you? Uh, yeah, that'd be really good. Uh, look, there's so, there's so much and I know there's a lot of... It's one of those weird things where... Someone said, it's like doing an, a, a university degree. Like, there's just so much that I had no goddamn idea was even a thing oh this will be fun for you though so we did the, I did the classes two weekends eight hours um with my partner there was three other couples in this class of the pregnant women two of them were nurses one of them was a midwife <gasps> and me oh. <laughs> that seems very unfair <laughs> So they're but like, you did uh-huh, win uh-huh. Dancing with the Stars. Did no, you, did you overtake about them? Birth stuff, and they're like, uh huh, uh huh. And I'm like, <laughs> bursting into tears, crying. I didn't know, you know, it was a oh, huge gosh. shock to me, but they were, they were like, it's fine. But it's going to be fine, I imagine. Like, what's your birth plan? My birth plan is this outside. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon it'll happen, because that... it just does seem to happen one way or another. It's not like, you know how finishing a, a screenplay or something is really hard? You know, like you wrote Rosehaven. It's really hard. You get to a certain point, you think, oh, why did we start this? I can't work the story out. Should we just stop, right? Yeah. With birth, I reckon it's harder than writing a sitcom. But, <laughs> but with a sitcom, you've always got the option to stop. And with birth, it will happen. That's what I feel really, like. Do you know this what I mean? Why, like, you don't need self-discipline. This is why the roller coaster thing seems right. And also, I do want to say... Roller coaster like, thing? You're not giving birth on a roller coaster. No. It, it feels like my... The, what it feels like is because there's been a bunch of people ahead of me, and then it feels like they're on the, the carts above, going about to go uh, over the top, and you just watch them disappear and you don't know. And at the uh, moment, everyone I knew who was ahead of me <gasps> has already gone. So it's like I'm at the front of the line of a water slide, just like, <gasps> oh, shit, I can't me. get out of it now. Yeah. Um, but oh, I will say, I'm very, like, like, I also have so many people in my life who are, you know, there's so many different ways to make a family and how hard it is. A lot of people yeah. really struggling to make it. So I'm very grateful. I've had a very minimally difficult pregnancy so far. So my genuine plan is, you know, and also, because you get told the scary stories, but it's really important to, to listen to the, the positive stories. And it's, yeah. you know. It's what are those, though? <laughs> I've never heard one of those. Very, the positive birth stories. Yeah. Like what? Like I had it in my sleep. Woke up, was just there. 
Yeah. Well, have you spoken to Felicity Ward? Felicity yeah. Ward says it's the most punk rock thing she's ever done. And she was fine. Boom, straight out. No really? tears. No tears. Wow. Um, That's quite Felicity Ward, though, isn't it? Yeah. She would stride around the stage and it would just sort of... She did it with heels on. She did not. No. I mean, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me, though. Listen, I, I, I have every faith that that baby's going to be out next time I see you. Um, and we're going to hear so many brilliant stand-up routines about what it's like to have a newborn baby and then a toddler. And I'm as excited, really, about the shows we're going to get from it as <laughs> you are about the baby. I really don't know. Like, honestly, and this is why this is really nice, and I say this genuinely, I really don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know if I'll come back to stand-up. I don't no. know. No! I, I don't know. I'm doing my writing and other things and stuff, but I might... I might want to start. I don't know. It, this is what is thing. You're it's trying to natural. prepare. I get it. I get it. And listen, if you retire from stand up, we will be grateful for the body of work we had. <laughs> However, I feel that the, even if you're not doing stand up anywhere else, when the guilty Femmes comes to town, we'll be able to course, lure you out of retirement. I mean, but I might. I might be doing burlesque. I might go into politics. Who knows? This is the thing. Is I'm currently trying to prepare for something you can't prepare for, and I'm very thinking, much aware that I might be a completely different person. So I, everything is up for grabs. Maybe I'll be a celebrity chef. Who I, knows? Think, I think you're going to become a teal candidate. A teal, maybe I'll be a teal yeah. candidate, Maria. We would vote for Celia Picola, wouldn't we? Oh we would campaign. We would vote. Teal candidate. I mean, I do look good in teal. <laughs> That's a terrible platform, isn't it? Vote for me because this colour shows off my eyes. <laughs> All right. We need to bring on our guests. Our first guest tonight is an award-winning musician, writer, and disability act advocate. I'm going to say that again for the podcast. They'll never know I screwed that up. <laughs> Eliza Hull is an award... Oh, I've said a name now. <laughs> Let's say it to the end. It's, it's here, but I never say it to the end. Right. The, listen, this is what you get if you come live. You see some of the mistakes, and you're like, wow, we're seeing stuff that those people at home will never see. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and put on bathers and tracksuit pants, because now I know. <laughs> I wasn't I wearing can... tracksuit pants. Oh. I was wearing... Is anyone else picturing tracksuit pants? Oh. I was wearing Vivian Westwood black trousers oh. over a full police swimsuit. Why? No one had any business being inspired by it. <laughs> Only intimidated. I'm still angry. I'll never let that go. I'll be on my deathbed thinking about that. Okay. Oh, God. This is the... This is... Listen, if you were at home, you wouldn't get these moments. You might be thinking, next time I'll stay home. <laughs> um, our first guest is an award-winning musician, writer, and disability advocate. Her music has been described as stirring, captivating, and heartfelt. She is regularly played on radio and tours nationally and internationally. She is a proud, disabled person with a physical condition, Charcot Marie Tooth, and consults on accessibility in the music industry. Recently, she was awarded the Music Victoria Amplify Award, the APRA Mentorship for Women in Music, and the National Leadership Award from the Australia Council and Art Access Australia. She was also the recipient of the Australian Women in Music Award. She recently released the book, We've Got This, Stories by Disabled Parents, and has a children's book coming out in September, if you weren't feeling like she was doing enough. <laughs> Please put your hands together and welcome to the mic, the incredible Eliza Hull. Show my bones for you 
to see. So that was absolutely stunning. That was absolutely breathtaking. Oh, really, really wonderful. Absolute chills. Now, before we talk about it, we have to introduce our next guest. She is one of Australia's foremost songwriters and vocalists. As one quarter of the band, all our exes live in Texas. She has toured Australia, the UK, the US, and Europe multiple times. Critically acclaimed the world over the band, won both the 2017 Aria Award and the 2017 Air Award for Best Blues and Roots Album. As a solo artist, she has a reputation as a remarkable performer and a sought-after session vocalist and musician, recording for TV, film, and on many songwriters' albums in a variety of genres. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises, and welcome to the mic, Georgia Mooney! <laughs> Hello. I just feel like I have to say it's, it feels so sacrilegious to play a keyboard on piano sound in Hamer Hall. Like, <laughs> there are, there's a Steinway in every dressing room, and I feel like they're all just collectively thinking, who the fuck let this riff raff in? <laughs> anyway. Ha-ha, <laughs> <laughs> suckers. Um, so... <laughs> This is a song about being powerless to someone's charms, uh, despite knowing it's quite bad for you. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> After another weekend of antagony, I'm out in disguise, fain and sparkle and shameless self certainty. I need the wolf for my eyes. Long nights I've laid awake, penning stories and songs for the sake of one day you'll 
come apart with a fool change of heart break it off break it off oh our sunset one dawn pull the pin and be gone break it off break it off I know I'll never have the heart to leave you if I'd known if I'd known If I'd known, if I'd known If I'd known Do me a favor and hide all the sweets away I've got no control Give me a word, there's still time to go roots and all How in you be reborn Don't say another word Or I'll swear to myself that I've heard One day you'll come apart With a full change of heart both absolutely incredible this feels like a, such a wonderful venue to hear your music in and I feel really privileged to have been sitting on the stage when that was going on um, can I ask you uh, firstly I, I'd love to come to you Eliza and ask you what was that could you talk us through what that song was about yeah so the song's called running underwater and it's about being disabled I have a physical disability it's called Sharko Mari tooth has nothing to do with my teeth, which right. has been quite unfortunate that every time I've said that out loud, people look at my teeth. <laughs> it has nothing to do with my teeth. It's a, a neurological condition that affects the way I walk. I fall over a lot. I can't get upstairs. Um, and, yeah, this song was really about feeling proud, actually, of having a disability, which has taken a very long time. And I've only started to feel really proud of my identity as disabled in the last, say, five or so years. And this is, was about that, feeling the weight of, of hiding and feeling the weight of having to always sit down and, and hide and hope that nobody would see the way that I walk and then feeling like, actually, I'm, I'm tired of that and I, I don't want to hold that weight anymore and 
I want to start speaking about it. And not only do I want to start speaking about it, I want to change the way that disabled people are represented and, and underrepresented. Yes. The, the visibility is everything, isn't it? Because it's part of the story, a part of the story of you being this beautiful singer-songwriter and it's part of your humanity. Um, I always think about Hannah Gadsby saying that story holds our cure, and I feel it really does, and I feel like one of the ways that uh, storytelling can be done in the most elevated way, in fact, is music. And I don't do... Do you ever think this, Celia? Mm. I was like, I love doing comedy, but then... I, and I feel pretty good about it, you know? And then I watch a musician, <laughs> yeah. like a singer songwriter, like, writer, and I just sit there and think, I have no talent. What's the like, point? What's the point? Like, that is a whole it's other a, talent. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a skill that I do not possess at all. And also, it's just as much as I appreciate and love the power of the spoken word, there's something and a place that music can touch that words can't, you know? Totally. Just got, ah, it's just... It's, it's another it's level. Really, like, yeah. instantly you can make us feel something. So basically you're here because we'd like some lessons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, Let's start I, look, at the video. Do you know, the, o- the only reason I would have a baby... <laughs> oh, oh, wouldn't that be great, though, if this just became... The rest of the show was the whole of The Sound of Music. <laughs> would love. Bags Gretel. Um, I was going to do the yodel bit. I won't do it. Yeah. The only reason I would have a baby is so she would be a singer-songwriter. <laughs> like, what if inside of you now you have Janis Joplin? Well, my partner's a musician, <gasps> so she getting lessons, not yeah. from me. I'll be and you can teach her the dance, um, Dancing sorry. with the Stars moves. Yeah. As yeah. long as she's not a comedian, and I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, listen, that's all, it's also a wonderful thing to be. It's just, you just watch it and you just go, <gasps> you just feel everyone yeah. floating. Um, it's- Incredible. Like, that was so good. And your, your song, I mean, because you do, that was one of your solo yeah. songs. Seems quite vacuous after Eliza's, I've got to say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, actually. No, of um, course. No, it's beautiful. It, it was incredible. I, I wanted to ask you because you're part of the band All Our Exes Live in Texas, which has got to be one of best the best band named band bands band ever. Band. Mm-hmm. Up there with the Shania Choir as well. Do you know the Shania Choir where people dress up like Shania Twain and sing Lovely. Shania Twain songs? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like, though, a Shania Twain tribute choir mm. doesn't quite have the cachet of all our exes live in Texas. No, no, no. You beat them, but it's still quite good. <laughs> I think we can all agree Shania choir is also delicious. Um, but we're not comparing you, and we just need to be clear about that. <laughs> but, it, but listen, if, would you like to join the Shania choir on the side? Oh, my gosh, so much. <laughs> that but would be heaven. How did you go? How, how was your uh, group formed? Well, can I also just say, we, All Our Exes Live in Texas was a last-minute decision, and we did not expect to have it 10 years on. <laughs> the oh. name or the, the name, group the itself? Na- no, the uh, name. Oh, right. So yeah. you wanted to do the band, but somebody pitched, pitched <laughs> the name as a joke, and then you're, now you've got it forever. Well, we needed to think of a name in a hurry, and so we Googled the worst country song titles of all time. Ah. <laughs> and there's some great ones. It's worth a Google. Um, there's things like... Drop kick me Jesus through the goalposts of life. Oh, that's cool. And I then, want to start a band just the... so it can be called that. Now. I feel like. Why do I feel like I've seen this list? Is one of them? How can I miss you if you'll never go away? That's one of them. Oh, it's. Been... I didn't write that, but I don't know why I've read this list. <laughs> it's been lonely in my saddle list? since my horse died. <laughs> There's also um, her teeth were stained, but her heart was pure, <laughs> which is nice. What was the saddle one? It's been lonely in the saddle since my horse died. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a line, so my ex, my ex ugh, ugh, should do that, but it was into country music, so I was like, and there was, a, I don't know if it's a line or an extra song, which is, save a horse, ride a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Bit no, of fun. No, no, <laughs> no. Because also, I'm thinking about it, nothing much rhymes with exes. Like, it's, it's very, mm. it's like, all our exes live in... That's it. They have to be in Texas. Well, uh, truth is, all our exes live in Brunswick, which is not <laughs> <laughs> the same. Snazzy. But you, can I ask, you've been la- labelled a girl band yes. just because you're women in a band. Yeah. How do you feel about that? It was a very interesting thing that we noticed shortly after we formed the band. Every article, every review, every interview mentioned in the first sentence that we were a girl band or that we were an all-female band and we found ourselves 
first of all, thinking it was quite weird. Like, none of, none of our male friends in bands are called boy bands mm. <laughs> unless they are the Backstreet Boys. Um, sure. One Direction. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just checking, you don't actually know the Backstreet Boys, do you? We actually toured with the Backstreet Boys. <gasps> you shut up! What? We did! What? I know. You know Joey Fat One. <laughs> That's a different band, mate. Oh, fuck. Anything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Get out of here. That's embarrassing for me. Okay, lock the for doors. For a lot of reasons, that's embarrassing for me. <laughs> so, so many. Lock the doors the rest of the night. We're in here till 4 a.m. and we're just grilling you about the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> that's the full... Fun with it, to be honest. Um, there was a moment when backstage with the Backstreet Boys, I was walking next to the security guard and we were walking um, together and he said, look, we're in sync. Ha <laughs> Oh. Bit of fun. The greatest pun <laughs> of all time. <laughs> and, and you were there to see it. Yeah. That's as, you know... Um, yeah. But to answer your question, yes, we, we noticed that we were called a girl band constantly and um, thought it was a bit strange because on the one hand, yeah, we wanted to celebrate the fact that we were all women and it was quite... Un- this was nine years ago. Um, but you look so young. Um, and... <laughs> How is that possible? Because your mum brought you here tonight. Yeah, <laughs> she actually did. Hi, mum. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, yeah, it sort of felt annoying. We just wanted to be a band. So it was a yeah. weird, I don't know. It's interesting because I'm trying to learn it. Because when I first thought that, I, I went, what's wrong with girl band? But of course it is. You will not get, like, yeah. girl band is a term, but then you think of... Mm. Pop, a pop group. Yeah, like we weren't singing or... To Become One. Yeah. 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 And you don't call Midnight Oil a boy band. Yeah. That would be so weird. Um, I would, we'd also get a lot of questions like, what's it like touring with all girls? And when are you going to break up? Because girl bands always break up. Um, and are you in sync? <laughs> hey. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Two great in sync pumps in the one night. I know. For no extra money, Melbourne. Um, Joey's sitting up in his bed like, someone's talking about me. Uh, <laughs> um, can, can I ask you... Um, Eliza, what are the things that you would like to have changed about the way that you are represented in music or you see other women being represented in music? It's a good question. Uh, I think just represented, full stop, is the the number one uh, because disabled people are generally not represented on TV, in film, in music, and yet disabled people are actually twice as likely statistically to create music... Really? But, yeah. Twice as likely? Twice as likely. Why, to, do you see, why is that? Well, I think we're, you know, potentially we have a lot to say. We're expressive, yeah. potentially. Uh, but often we're not visibly seen, uh, and that is because there are so many barriers to even get into a venue, even get up onto a stage. And so that's the changes that I want to see. In terms of women, I think often... Women aren't even credited as songwriters or as producers, often not believe that they're the ones that are actually making the music and, and producing the music. So, and also just, again, underrepresented. And often, especially, like, there's a lot of ageism in the music industry. And so when women especially have children or, or get older, are generally not on radio and not seen as viable, whereas men... Uh, I don't know what it, what it is, but men are often... Oh, yeah, like, Bono's got loads of children. Exactly, is represented. There to, is there something to do with the, uh, the amount of touring that's involved in music for women having families and that yeah. causing complications? I think so. Know. And look, again, for disabled people, I think the music industry, because it is so inaccessible and by having a disability, it can make it harder to, you know, tour that that's often why we're not seeing that representation. But I just recently was on a panel around mental health and it was on parenting. And I just said, why don't they have, like, some sort of childcare area backstage where children can come and actually be part of the music festival instead of, you know, not not including families, not including mothers? I I love it when you... I went to Blues Fest 
this year, last year, whatever. But I love when you go to festivals and that's one of my favourite things in the world. You know, and they have the cart. When you see families there and you yeah. see children there and it's a beautiful thing. But particularly when you see babies with the massive headphones on. I love oh. that. Which I know, <laughs> I know is to protect their ears from the loud music, but it looks like they're tiny baby DJs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just next now time I'm you see, see it, you're like, ah, ah. Tiny baby DJ. But, uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things, you know, because some people do do it. You do see that they... But you need a support network to help you at yeah, gigs absolutely. looking after... Yeah. D- does it start earlier that boys are encouraged to go and do garage bands and go and play in pubs, but there are barriers to doing those gigs or, you know, there's a concern that they'll be sexually harassed or... Like, mm. does it start earlier? Do we need to be... Uh, not just encouraging boys to play electric guitars and girls to do grade seven piano and mm-hmm. then do a little pia- concert for their grandparents and you know go back to their room and play some John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I, I definitely remember feeling, you know, in high school, or, or it's much more normal for a boy to spend eight hours in his bedroom playing guitar, whereas if a girl is doing that, you're sort of like, what are you doing? Get, come on, you, you've got to be social, do more things. Um, I find myself even still, and I, th- I, I think it's a female thing, even still I'll think I shouldn't practice the piano for too long. I should do some other more kind of um, serious, organised things. And I think, no, there's actually nothing better that I could do than practice the piano for too long. Um, so I feel like, well, yeah, maybe we don't encourage girls in the same way to kind of like do the 10,000 hours in your bedroom and, um, f- yeah, form those bands and, and start kind of young. That was, a, that was a difference for me, I think. Did you start young? Did you both start young? Yeah, I started singing when I was five. Five? Uh, yeah, you don't want to know what song that was. When what I was did. it? No, it's actually... <laughs> I do want to know. I shouldn't have I even said have that. I didn't Tony. even think of well, it. Yeah, horrible... No, you've said I don't want to know. I definitely do. Uh, well, it was actually a song that was written by not a, not a great man. So, oh, yeah. I see. Speaking of not great men, <laughs> the, the, the Me Too movement really took off in Hollywood but didn't catch fire in the same way in the music industry. Do you know why? Do you have any theories as to why? I think it's a really interesting thing to contemplate. I, definitely when Me Too kicked off, the music industry responded in a big way and I think they're in Australia can only really speak from Australia, but there were a lot of well-intentioned kind of groups started to to gather evidence and for musicians to tell their stories and for planning to begin on how to address the issues and how to hold people to account. And then for one reason or another, a lot of that movement sort of fell away. And I think a big part of it is that the defamation laws in Australia are whack and heavily uh, favour the person who is suing for defamation. And some pretty high-profile cases happened where, you know, they didn't go perhaps as they should have. And um, I think that's put a lot of people off. There's also... I feel like in the music industry we didn't have the same sort of... uh, huge names coming forward like Mm. there were big film stars which gained a lot of media attention who were saying things and there wasn't quite the same movement with musicians and I think part of that is because you know Mm. it's not a matter of I made a film with a director a couple of years ago often the problem might be this is a label boss or an executive in a company with whom I have a contract for 10, 20 years, and so the stakes are really high, mm. I think. Whereas you go from movie to movie, it's not, it's, it, music's still like the, the old Hollywood system where you'd be signed to Warners or something and then you were stuck with them, so you didn't want to make, yeah. uh, it, it could be career ending. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think weighing up the cost of do I potentially severely endanger my career, which is already pretty hard to make a living from, um, and speak up, or do I just sort of allow someone else to do it. In saying that, though, there was some incredible women coming forward, like really underground and in Australia, like Jaguar Jones, who spoke up and... Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And uh, Denless Hanlon has been sacked and now a female is at the top of Sony, 
which yeah. is a huge, huge step forward. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be massive. And just on, your, on a gigging day-to-day level, have you noticed a change in the environment? Are there more conversations? Is there, you know, is it seemingly... Yeah, look, I think it's a safer space. I don't know if you feel that, Georgia, but I, I mean, I've been in the industry for a little while and I remember one, you know, talking about, I remember, you know, driving down the freeway and singing Cheryl Crow's every day as a winding road and thinking that I was going to go and be a superstar. Um, <laughs> and my mum said, no, there's no chance because the music industry, I guess, you know, it's a quite a scary environment, late nights. And she said, you have to go and get that uni degree. So I did. I enrolled and then just kept deferring every, every year <laughs> to try and pursue Never. my music. I did finally finish the degree. Um, but, yeah, I guess for me now, I do feel like it is a safer environment. And I guess that is why I'm speaking about disability. When I went to a producer, um, when I first moved to Melbourne, I remember him saying to me, just whatever you do, don't walk in the film clip. Don't show that you have a disability. What? And, yeah, now, like, I feel like I wouldn't, A, allow that to be said, and, B, I don't don't, don't feel like it it wouldn't happen now. I feel like we are speaking about diversity, and that includes women and and gender-diverse people, and the music industry is feeling definitely more equal, Mm. starting to, anyhow. Mm. What is it uh, that the music industry could do better and what is it that we as music lovers or there may be some people in the music industry in the audience can do to help? In terms of disability? Mm. Uh, I guess I I feel like the first thing is venues simply need to list what accessibility they have in their venue so that it's not up to disabled people having to get on the phone and ring and say, can I get into your venue? Do you have an accessible toilet? Even listing if your venue is inaccessible is a good thing. Uh, reaching out to bands and saying, what is your access rider, like you would for any kind of rider. Again, so it's not on the disabled person to have to constantly ask. Uh, and I guess in terms of you know website, making that accessible, social media, doing image descriptions for blind people, people that have low vision, captioning videos and stories, and so that um, you know people that are deaf, hard of hearing, uh, are getting that message across, and represent you know just having representation. So buying music from uh, disabled artists is such a big thing. Uh, because without that, we don't feel like we can we can get our music out there, and we are so greatly underrepresented. Mm. Uh, can I ask? Because I'm definitely going to buy it, no matter what you say. But what's your children's book about? <laughs> <laughs> it's called "Come Over to My House." And it's about authentically portraying disabled people in the home. Yes. So inside each home, there is a child and or a parent with a disability and what makes that home unique and interesting and fun is the fact that this person has a disability and I think that that again is just wanting to enable more representation and and enable more conversations because I think a lot of young people and kids don't know how to talk about disability and a lot fear and scared because they're scared of disabled people Uh, So my opinion is that the more conversations we have, that we reduce these stigmas. Absolutely. I'm so into it. And starting early as well with the children's books is so great. So Nellie Thomas, I don't know if you've come across her, has a bunch of books for for neurodiverse children, like some brains, some boys, some girls. They're really great. Mm. But just in a way, just starting as early as possible is such a fun and excellent way to start that conversation. And make it ordinary. Yeah. make Make it every day and not other. I would like to ask you, Georgia, uh, what is it that we as music lovers could do for women in the music industry? It's increasingly hard to to make money, isn't it? Because we just stream everything off Spotify. Um, Mm -hmm. How could we support you? Uh, Well, I I feel really positive about women in music at the moment because I feel like there have been massive changes in terms of uh, representation. And, you know, there's been surreal moments of um, actively... Uh, making sure that festivals have got a gender balance and lots of stuff. And now, you know, from when 
All Our Exes started, it was really rare that there was an all-female band. Now that they're, they're everywhere and women are totally dominating the charts and it's the best ever. Um, but obviously, yeah, consuming as much female music as possible is awesome. At the moment, I would say, because the pandemic has just been hell on so many levels, buying tickets to shows would be nice. Yeah. And buying vinyl, buying merch and that kind of thing, I think will really help. But um, definitely, yeah, going out and seeing music again, I think there's still some sort of nervousness there, understandably, but that'd be awesome. Of course. But yes, buy, buy the ticket, uh, mm. even if you don't go. Mm. Um, <laughs> True, we just need the money. And could you tell us about Supergroup? Yeah, so Supergroup is a live concert series that I developed in 2019, pre-Pando, and it's about to do um, a tour along the East Coast for the first time. And essentially each night I invite three different guest songwriters to join me on stage, and we sit in a little semicircle, not unlike this, and we take turns to play songs and join in with one another and we've got a house band behind us so it's a big full awesome sound and in between I interview everyone and it's a real kind of showcase of a variety of musicians everyone's from you know a different musical or cultural background or a different stage in their career and we sort of really um, talk about the way the songs were made and talk about experiences as musicians and then sort of ask the question what do, you know what does it sound like if you combine a pop musician or a hip-hop artist and a um, folk artist. You know, they're all quite different, but we sort of speak this language and it's quite fun to experiment with that how sounds that sounds. absolutely incredible. It's I'm fun. so, so excited to see that. Um, <laughs> there so are shows in Melbourne. Can I just quickly yeah, plug that can. so quickly? In, so in Melbourne, we've got two shows. Um, the first one is with Claire Bowditch. <laughs> Here she is now. What? <laughs> um, that's a Claire Burditch I is that prepared Claire earlier. Right yes. there. What are the chances? Genuinely, we <laughs> didn't know that was going to happen. That's incredible. <laughs> and um, lucky I didn't say I've anything fucked about you, so, Claire. Woo. No, and okay, no. Bob Excellent. Evans, <laughs> and we've also got. Maple Glider, we've got wow. Ryan Downey, we've got Moju, um, Ruby Gill. Wonderful. So come, it's a Brunswick Ballroom. So Bruns- so with Brunswick Hall, Brunswick where Hall, all, your exes yes. live, <laughs> all your exes will be there. Yes. Um, so please uh, Google and get tickets for Supergroup as much as possible. Um, we do need to end our show very soon. So can I just ask you this one last question? Is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? that you want this audience to know. It could be something that you want to plug or just an idea around feminism and music. Um, anything at all that you came to say and you didn't get to say. Celia, anything you came to say and you didn't get to say? No, I'm going to spend the rest of the night going, why did I say that thing I did say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm the opposite. I've got a few things I'd like to take back. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you've been absolutely incredible. Uh, and l- the only thing you're plugging at the moment is your baby. <laughs> So, no need to plug anything else. Uh, <laughs> no. Right. Um, Georgia, anything you came to say you didn't get to say? Um, I love you, Deb. Oh. <laughs> no. Uh, Eliza, anything you came to say you didn't get to say? Uh, I've got my book for sale here. <laughs> We've got this. Stories by Disabled Parents is out there to buy. So that's exciting. Excellent. And buy that. I love Claire Bowditch. <laughs> Claire Bowditch is oh, yeah. the quote is on Claire the front Bowditch, cover. Is there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? <laughs> you guys are amazing. Oh, <laughs> bless you. Um, and I did promise that if anybody had a project they needed help with, uh, they could speak up now. So anyone just shout out if you've got a project? Yes, what's your project? Your friends is good, that's feminism, the sisterhood working. <laughs> is your friend not here? Can you, do you mind just running up and saying it into the mic? Because otherwise the podcast audience at home won't hear it. So could you just run over there, see where that little green glow is, and just give us an elevator pitch of what, what, what you need and what we can do. Hi, I'm Victoria. Victoria. Um, I work with an organisation called Women's Environmental Leadership Australia. So your plug about the greenies 
calling out for people totally where we're at. Um, <laughs> but basically, our premise um, recognises, like, frankly, strongman, hero-led politics, business, civil society, not entirely working out for our environment or climate. Not as much as we anywhere. Like it to be. Um, collaborative, networked, bottom-up solutions, totally where it's at. Kind of mirrors women's leadership. And so uh, we want to see and support more women stepping into leadership for our environment. And anyone who wants to talk to us about that, we'd love to talk to you. And to the Teal Independents, who totally took it and just put that onto the national stage. Well done. Thank you. We salute Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, where can people... People can talk to you in the foyer, but where can they go online to join this? Yeah, so Wella, W-E-L-A, wella.org.au. Come find us. We run leadership development for women who work on climate and environmental issues, and we want to support you and work with you and work so, out how we open doors for each other. So does the woman already have to be in STEM in some way or in the environment to join your program? Either voluntarily or working on this issue, if this is an issue you're passionate about and want to get involved in. So they don't talk. have to be a scientist? No, no. Okay. There's lots of different ways. So if you, if, listen, um, the one thing I will say is um, the end of the world is not terrible for women. So it is a feminist issue. Um, just give us a cheer if you give a fuck about the planet. <laughs> Give us a cheer if you're a woman who feels like you would like to lead the planet out of a disaster zone. <laughs> Therefore, you are a woman who can lead. This is for you. This isn't for somebody else who's better than you. This isn't for somebody else, your friend, who's so perfect. This is for you. And you can lead. You can lead the energy of the room. People don't know that. They go into a room and they think, oh, this one, oh, no, I have to wait. No, anyone can change the energy of the room. You can change the energy of the room. So you need to get onto that website. Just say it one more time. Wella, W-E-L-L-A. W-E-L-A dot org dot A-U. Dot org dot A-U. If you are a woman and you are in Australia, this is for you. If you are listening around the world, I'm sure there are similar things where you are. Google them, look them up. If every, there's so much challenge in this room. If everybody in this room decided that they were going to lead, then, and, and everyone listening around the world decided they were going to lead, that would shift things so remarkably. So stop thinking of yourself as a follower or someone who just has to retweet petitions. You can lead. <laughs> get involved. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's incredible. And I'm sure they need money. I'm sure they need money. Victoria, do you need money? You... Yes, she needs money. Dave, she needs money. You can't just say you're a feminist and listen to a podcast. She doesn't want you leading because we've tried men leading. It hasn't worked out. So she wants your money, Dave. What do you do for a living, Dave? Sorry? IT. Yeah, you've got loads of money. Um, uh, so we've come to our closing moment, Melbourne. You have been an incredible audience. I would say you've been the finest audience of your generation. Um, and before we close, I just want to say a huge round of applause to everyone here at Hamer Hall. Everyone at Boehm Presents, who's been producing our tour so incredibly. Alana's here tonight. She's done so much for it. Everyone at Boehm. And uh, Michael, our tour manager, it's been really incredible. We've come to that point in the tour where we're flying in the morning and then we're performing in the evening. And today we got delayed. It's been a, it's, it's been a rock star day, except we didn't have a private jet. Um, <laughs> As it would be bad for the environment, Victoria. Um, can I have a huge, huge, huge round of applause for Georgia Mooney? <laughs> Eliza Hull? <laughs> Celia Pecola? <laughs> Amal Leotalu? <laughs> and finally, to close the show, the incredible Grace Petrie! <laughs> Sorry, before I came from over there, I saw you all looking over there. I was like, I'm over here. It's very panto. Goodness me. I love doing this show so much. It's the best thing that I do in my, in my career, in my working life. I mean, I...
I just fucking adore it and it gives me so much hope. I think that hope is, is the hardest thing to come by these days, you know what I mean? And I think like, obviously we've talked a lot about uh, Roe v. Wade tonight and it is obviously like Celia Wright, I think all of us are in the same situation as you were articulating so brilliantly there as like so fucking heartbroken and angry about us going backwards, you know? And I find that like, on the days that I find it the hardest to keep going with feminism or with, you know, queer rights or with anti-racism or whatever it is, I think the days that it is the hardest to keep hope, those are the days that we fucking need it the most, you know, because they rely on us getting so cynical that we forget that the world can be better. Do you know what I mean? So um, I wrote a song about that. Oh, thanks. And uh, I promise it is an optimistic song. <laughs> but it is called The Losing Side. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to... Uh, this is from my new album. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you the chorus, if that's okay. So we'll do it a line at a time. I'll sing a line, and you are going to repeat the line after me. Are you with me, Melbourne? Cool. Okay, so it goes like this. If I spend my life on the losing side... Try that. If I spend my life on the losing side... You can lay me down knowing that I tried. You can lay me down knowing that I tried. There's a better world and on a quiet day. There's a better world and on a quiet day. When I hold my breath, I can hear her say, when I hold my breath, I can hear her say. That's the chorus. I'm going to do that loads of times. I'd love it if you'd sing that as loud as you can. I guess I'm... From common grief to Bristol up in flames. We came here begging justice. And instead we got the blame For peace disturbed Out on the streets tonight And watching on the BBC You know something's not right When mourners come With candles and with flowers Wrestled three on one And pinned down by the state's full powers This is their world And these have been the rules we have come to break it down with bloody fingernails for tools. This threat of violence, this tightrope wire. We can no longer bear it. We're all too fucking tired. No minute silence. We will sing higher. Don't tell us to light a candle when we have come to start a fire. And if I spend my life on the you can lay me down Knowing that I try There's a better world And on a quiet day When I hold my breath I can hear her say She's on her way She's on her way And safe at home you watch it on TV Never dream that one day You might be the enemy You might one day be under attack From all that should protect you Hoping someone has your back The history books are screaming from the shelves And no government who outlaws speaking to the and ourselves has good things planned A storm ahead I see And not one of us will bear it Without solidarity Oh, I see trouble All my days This ailing, failing world Sends signs of fire and flood and plague But from the rubble From the rays the mightiest cathedral From these ashes we will raise And if I spend my life On the losing side You can lay me down Knowing that I try There's a better world And on a quiet day When I hold 
hold my breath I can hear her say Take heart my sister This fire will never die Take heart my comrade Tried. There's a better world And on a quiet day When I hold my breath I can hear her say That she is on her way Praise Petrie, everybody! You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me Francis White, guest host Edith Bacola, and my very special guests Eliza Hull, Georgia Mooney, and Amaya Leota Lou, with music from Grace Petrie. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge, produced by Nick Sheldon, the producer for the Spontaneity Job was Tom Selinski. Thanks to Bjorn Jody and Bone Presents, and everyone at the Arts Centre Melbourne, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. strike these mics um or actually um could a lovely man strike the mics thank you so much thank you thank you so much this is going to be wonderful to work. you could supervise this <laughs> i should have got i should have outsourced it. i should have got you to tell him thank you thank you so much thank you so much um and mal that was absolutely brilliant thank you so much The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.